Thank you, Ryan. Um, I think I'll just, in regard to Exaudio, I'll just refer you to this little handout that was available as you came in. I don't know if you noticed it. Maybe you can catch it on the way out. It tells you a little bit about our speaker this year. This is the fourth annual Exaudio lectureship. On the back, it tells you a little bit about Beth Silvers and then a little bit about Exaudio. And so I, uh, I want to introduce her and say a little bit about her book uh, for those of you that don't know uh, much about her or haven't read the book. So um, uh, she earned her JD degree from the University of Kentucky uh, College of Law and her BA from Transylvania University. Uh, Beth Silver's professional experience includes 11 years with a large Midwestern law firm as an attorney and human resources executive. Tabor seniors currently in the Christian Faith course have read the book uh, that Beth Silvers co-authored with Sarah Stewart Holland, titled, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening, published last year by Thomas Nelson. Uh, the book is about two Christian women, both trained attorneys on opposite sides of the political spectrum, who are able to trust each other enough to team up to create a podcast that continues today. The goal of this podcast is to model how people can talk to one another about important and controversial issues and without compromising their own convictions can actually make progress by learning from one another. They acknowledge that as white middle to upper class people, they speak from a position of privilege, but their insights and experience give them something very positive to offer. Since Beth will not be speaking about the book uh, this morning, I wanna give a very brief overview of its contents. Uh, for those of you that have not read it. Be sh assured that the book is full of specific examples and stories that illustrate the points I'm going to mention here. After an introduction that describes their history and the basics of their podcast, the book is divided into 10 chapters that outline uh, their insights on difficult relationships. The first chapter acknowledges the conventional wisdom that to get along with people, you should never talk politics or religion. And we may have had experiences uh, that kind of confirm that little adage. But the authors urge that if we are to make progress on hard topics, we need to talk together and learn from each other. They challenge the idea that the only way we can show that we care about deep convictions is to ignore what others have to say except to tell them that they're wrong. The second chapter makes the case that in our country today, we tend to wear invisible jerseys that align us with ideological teams of various sorts. Competition is exciting and we like to win. And uh, so the authors urge us to reject a team first mentality when it comes to issues that, that affect all of us. The third chapter asks us to discover why we care about whatever the issue is. What outcome do I hope will happen? Uh, the more we can identify the deep values we care about, the better we can spot the ideas or policies that can accomplish them. In the fourth chapter, they make the case that institutions such as government are, ne are neither the sole cause nor the sole solution to the problems that we care about. Chapter five urges us to extend grace to one another, that is kindness, respect, and dignity. This does not, however, mean that all viewpoints are equally valid. Yet by extending grace to those who disagree with us, we reaffirm our common humanity and are more likely to adopt a problem-solving mode rather than a win-lose mentality. In the remaining chapters, the authors encourage us to take a curiosity approach to those we disagree with rather than starting by trying to change them. It is also important to recognize that issues are complex. Simplistic approaches won't help solve these issues. In fact, we may often need to realize that there is truth on two sides of a problem and that we must avoid losing what, what either group is emphasizing. If we really care about the issues and want to help solve them, we will need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, such as having tangled and difficult conversations with others when it is easier to simply pull away. We also need to exit the echo chambers that simply reaffirm what we already believe. Rather, we need to get bold enough to listen to what the other side is saying. Their final chapter invites us to recognize shades of gray 
along with the truths and convictions that we refuse to compromise on. They challenge us to model good ways of handling conflict and disagreement for the sake of our children and the generation they represent. We're all disappointed that Beth Silvers could not be here in person today, she is well, but are glad that it was possible virtually. So please express your welcome to Beth Silvers. Hi, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I wish we could be together in person, but hopefully we can connect powerfully one way or the other. My life's work, which I'd like to tell you a bit about today, is rooted in connecting powerfully over the internet, so hopefully that digital connection will be here for us. I know that the process of preparing to talk with you has impacted me, and I hope something in my words today might stick with you. My work is something that I could never have imagined as a college student. I graduated from college a year before the very first podcast was produced, and I would never have imagined that someday I might write a book that was actually published and sold. There are all kinds of dimensions to my work that feel exceptionally strange to me, but when I think about the calling of my work, I feel the truth of it. And I'm so happy that right now I can articulate that I think I understand my calling, which is to work toward greater grace in human relationships. But getting to that understanding has really been a journey. Calling is so hard to define, even as some of our brightest scholars and wisest faith leaders are focusing their energy on this subject. So I turned 40 in March, and in my almost four decades, I've learned a lot about what calling is not, and I thought I might share that with you today. Let me first give you the abbreviated version of my career. I majored in business in college. I went to law school. I took a job right out of law school with a large regional firm, and I spent six years as an associate in private practice, mostly working in corporate bankruptcy. I hated being a lawyer, so I went to my firm and expressed my desire to work with people. The firm agreed, so I spent five years as an HR executive. I started a podcast with my friend Sarah as a hobby. I became a yoga teacher as a hobby. And eventually I quit my full-time secure six-figure a year job to grow the podcast and write a book and do a little bit of business coaching on the side. That's the short version. I could bore you with lots of details about every step along the way, but what I realize when I put this abbreviated version of my career together is that the transition points are where I have really experienced God and calling. When I decided to move out of Lexington, Kentucky, where I had done all of my schooling to Cincinnati, Ohio for my big firm law job, um, I made that decision at the same time that my now husband and I decided to get married. And looking back, those decisions are so linked that I can't pull them apart. When I decided to stop practicing law, I had just had my first daughter. And looking back, those decisions are so linked that I can't pull them apart. When I decided to start the podcast, I had just had my second daughter. Same thing with those decisions. And it feels terribly anti-feminist or something to say that everything really important in my career has been attached to a personal relationship. But the truth is, I have learned that those relationships are part of the guidepost in terms of what my life is supposed to look like. And I think it could have come in forms other than marriage and motherhood, for sure. Certainly, most of my career has been shaped now by the friendship of another woman. Um, so I don't think any of that is necessary, but I think it is part of my journey and it's important for me to be honest about that. So I don't know exactly how to tell you what calling is, but sometimes knowing what is not is helpful as we inch our way in the direction of what something is. So I wanted to just share four ideas that I've tried on as substitutes for calling that have very much not worked for me. For the first half of my life, I substituted achievement for calling. I centered my identity in my grades, 
in awards and leadership and winning talent shows and speech contests, being the best at whatever I did was so essential to me that I closed the door on anything that didn't come naturally. I wanted to play softball with my best friend, but I was the worst at softball, so I quit after a season. I told myself I hated golf, but I was really just bad at it. I gave up tennis before I even started. There's definitely a sports theme here, and that's something that I feel a deep sense of regret about, and I'm working on it as an adult. I have deprived myself of lots of fun and opportunity and exercise and friendship and life lessons because I have been afraid of failing. But I've also struggled to feel energized in my success. The thing is, when you define yourself by external validation, grades, how much money you make, what other people think about you, there is no growth. There is only not failing. You meet expectations, but you never exceed them. It's never about deepening your understanding or shifting in a way that creates new perspective. It's just the constant exercise of not failing. It took too long, but I finally learned that God doesn't create us to strive and not fail. Achievement is too fickle to be calling, too one-dimensional. It's too depleting. It takes and it takes and it never gives to us in a real way. It is great to work hard, to build skills, to succeed by traditional definitions, but making that the centerpiece of your energy is too much pressure and not enough meaning. So it is no substitute for calling. Achievement is not it. Relatedly, calling as a solo venture is not a thing. As kind of a natural offshoot of my achievement orientation, I have looked for most of my life for a purpose that only I could uniquely accomplish. It's <laughs> so embarrassing and arrogant when I say it out loud. But I think that we've all gotten a message over and over that is about what are we meant to do? What are you meant to do? You with your gifts, you with your time, talent, and treasure. You, you, you. But the other side of you, you, you is me, 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 which does not sound great. And for me, that has led to lots of loneliness. Loneliness has really been the biggest struggle of my life, and loneliness has never led me well. The kinds of questions that I've tried to answer by myself, questions like, what should I major in? What should I do after college? Should I take this job? Should I leave this job? Those decisions have been almost unbearably stressful, and my answers have not always been great. I struggled to choose a major in college, and I decided one day to just go with business because it felt like a realistic check on my inclinations toward things like poetry and music that would never pay the bills. I struggled with what to do after college, and I defaulted really to law school because I was still just on this achievement treadmill, and I'm better with words than numbers. I tell people now, I do more research to buy skincare products than I did to decide to go to law school. It's just something that I fell into because I didn't lean into my relationships. I settled on a job after law school based on the largest available paycheck because I felt like I had invested a lot in my education and needed to demonstrate a return. Now I had a whole support system that I could have leaned on during these processes and I just didn't. I didn't ask people what they thought I was good at or how they thought I could contribute the most. I didn't ever think about what I could be building with other people. I was just looking for some version of where I could be best. Fortunately, that is not what my life has become. The first places that I live out my calling are in my relationships, my marriage, my friendships, my relationship as an adult with my parents, my relationship with my daughters and my sister and her family. These are all places where I feel a sacred sense that I'm being refined and worked on, and that I'm influencing others to help support their work in the world. And professionally, Sarah and I work in a 50-50 partnership on our podcast, our book, Speaking Everything. We make decisions together. We establish our values and our priorities together. We are a joint venture. And we both understand that our blend of personalities, which are very, very different, and our skills make our work worthwhile. Neither of us is more important than the other. 
some people in our audience like to talk about being team Sarah or team Beth, but we never think of it this way. We cannot do our work without each other. We also cannot do our work without the people who listen to our podcast and read our book and write to us. We don't know enough to carry the entirety of the important civic conversations that our country needs to have. We would be on a fool's errand to try to do that. So we are trying in everything we do to just invite other people's thoughts and ideas in. This process can be very vulnerable. It can be scary. It can be painful. It can be annoying. Um, Sometimes we don't like what we hear from other people at all, but all of it helps us grow. When I look at my life now, I see partnership everywhere. And I understand that God creates us to need each other, to build things together, to serve in community, to have moments when we're not all together and we need someone else to help us pull the load. We are supposed to have moments when someone else needs us and we pull all our strength together to support them. I also realize more and more that none of us, no matter how smart we are, how hard we work or how well we listen and learn, none of us have enough perspective to do holy work alone. And I think that realization would help us combat so many societal problems racism and classism and sexism, all the ways in which we treat each other as separate and less than, I think we could combat those problems more courageously and honestly if we recognize that by ourselves, none of us have the perspective to do holy work. On a personal level, understanding that I am just a piece of my calling, but that my calling is bigger than me, has been such an unbelievable relief and the greatest lesson of my life. I have also come to understand that calling is not a guarantee. I think I had some conception along the way that once I got on the right path, that path would be smooth. Or maybe that if I were doing the right work, that would be universally acknowledged. Or maybe if I'm speaking from a place of calling, that I wouldn't get anything wrong. But that's not how any of this works either. Calling still requires learning and falling and getting back up. It involves lots of no's because even the right path has a ton of detours and off ramps and choices about which way to turn. Clarity of calling does not eliminate complexity in our lives. I truly wish I had better news for you than that. I'm really surprised that I'm able to make a living doing a podcast. It's a phenomenal gift. I also recognize that there are people in my line of work who make dramatically more money than I do. I'm really surprised that we have such an audience that is large enough that podcasters dream of it. And I know that our audience is tiny compared to the big shows. Again, all of that external information, validation, ways of measuring doesn't confirm or deny any aspect of what we do. I get stuff wrong all the time. I have changed my party since we started a podcast about politics. I mess up on the show and in talks like this one, I have to apologize. I have to read and learn more. Sometimes people send me really sharp emails or write mean things about me on Instagram. And sometimes I deserve that. I think all of this is necessary. It's not about being venerated. It's not about being persecuted. It's just being a person on the road of life. Living into my calling does not eliminate all of the messy and embarrassing hard knock parts of being a person. The last thing I've learned about what calling isn't is a little bit harder for me to put into words. The best that I can find right now is that calling is not a beginning or an ending. It's just not linear at all. I can't pinpoint a day when it felt like I have discovered my calling, hooray. Um, And a lot of pieces in my work shift all the time. The way that I'm doing it shifts, especially through COVID-19. And that change happens without me feeling like, oh, my calling is changing. I don't think everything in my life has happened for a reason. And I don't think everything in my life has led me to this particular point. I think tons of things could have been different, and I think tons of things can be different. I think lots could fall apart 
or transform and I could still be living in my calling. It's just not one thing, which might have you thinking and sometimes has me thinking, well, then what is it? Is calling a thing at all? Well, here's what I've settled on in uh, year 40 of life. I reserve the right to change my mind. Right now, I believe it's a thing because for me, there is no other explanation for the peaceful, purposeful way of being in a very unforgiving world that I feel and that I witness in so many other people. If I try to put words to calling, I come up with this. God has built an invitation for each of us. That invitation is made up of our spiritual gifts, our natural talents, our interests, our relationships, our life experiences, and our environments. And the invitation is for us to engage with the world in ways that will inspire more wholeness in it and in us. I know that's pretty squishy, but I think that squishiness is really beautiful. This invitation in my life has felt like a series of breadcrumbs, persistent breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs that will lead me out of the places I go into that are off the path. Those breadcrumbs led me to get an education that I needed to pursue my calling, and then they led me out of the traditional path associated with that education. Those breadcrumbs have helped me build skills that assist in living out my calling, but those skills have seen random and unrelated to each other at times. Calling has led me from doing future problem solving competitions as a student to becoming a yoga teacher as an adult. It's all over the place, but it all comes together in this very strange work that I do. It all belongs. It all matters. That's true for everything that has felt like failure to me too. Bosses that I didn't like and who did not like me my inability to be at all competitive as a lawyer, the moments as a mother when I have overreacted or underreacted. I've learned something from every low point in my life that contributes to my calling. Again, I don't think this means that I have been particularly attuned to God's plan for me. And I don't think that suffering mine or anyone else's has been designed to teach me something. I just think that God is a remarkable pragmatist, that God works with whatever is, and like a pasta dough, God brings all this together, just this gathering of what is, and shapes it into something useful. I thought I might leave you with a poem from Dana Falds called White Dove that I think about often when I'm considering calling. She writes, in the shared quiet, an invitation arises like a white dove lifting from a limb and taking flight. Come and live in truth. Take your place in the flow of grace. Draw aside the veil you thought would always separate your heart from love. All you ever longed for is before you in this moment if you dare draw in a breath and whisper yes. I hope that whatever you're studying and whatever you've tried on as calling that has not worked for you, and wherever your heart is leading you right now, you can feel yourself taking your place in the flow of grace. Just uh, one more word. Um, Beth Silver's presentation this evening at seven o'clock is entitled Envisioning a Grace-Filled America. Uh, she's going to address something different than what she did just now and different than her book as well. And so, I invite you all to return this evening at 7 o'clock. Have a good day.